Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Robert Jensen. He's an author and a professor of journalism at the University of Texas at Austin. A series of Saudi-led airstrikes on a UN-run refugee camp in Yemen yesterday resulted in the deaths of nearly 30 civilians, including women and children. A total of 40 are dead and 200 injured. Saudi Arabia, which is spearheading a 10-member war coalition in close collaboration with the United States, denies that it struck the Al-Mazra camp, where thousands have taken refuge, while a Shia Houthi rebellion has captured most of the nation and driven out the president. News media are reporting that the Saudi bombing campaign on Monday was the single deadliest since the air war began last Thursday. The likelihood of Saudi ground troops entering Yemen in the near future remains high. Well, Bob, according to The Economist, quote, the only people to benefit from Yemen's disintegration may be Sunni jihadists pledging allegiance to either al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. Do you agree? Yeah, this is a disaster that only seems to keep getting worse. Let's start by recognizing the U.S. is allied here with the Saudis, a brutal monarchy, which is afraid of its own internal Shia population, and the Egyptians of a military dictatorship, essentially. Uh, and we're allied with those two countries against Iran, which is at least a, a modified parliamentary democracy. So the hypocrisy of the U.S. policy throughout the whole region is seen here again. It's not clear that anything good can come from this unless there's a political settlement which would require negotiations, which would require the Saudis and the Egyptians to back down. The U.S. can contribute by, by helping that happen, but so far the U.S. is not doing that. And while the national outrage aimed at Indiana's new religious freedom law is justifiable, another story in the same state that is just as chilling, if not more, has received very little attention. On Monday, a 33-year-old woman named Purvi Patel was sentenced to 20 years in prison for essentially having a miscarriage. Patel was convicted a month ago on charges of negligence and feticide. In July 2013, she arrived at a hospital bleeding heavily and admitted that she had been pregnant and miscarried and had expelled what was a essentially a fetus about 22 weeks gestated. She had received no prenatal care. But prosecutors say the fetus was 30 weeks old and viable, and that Patel had knowingly taken miscarriage-inducing drugs to terminate her pregnancy, even though no such evidence of such drugs was ever found in her bloodstream. Patel, who is the daughter of Indian immigrants to Indiana, is the first woman to be convicted of feticide. She's the second woman to have been charged after another immigrant of Chinese descent. Bob, there are so many things appallingly wrong about this case, but I'm wondering if you can simply comment on why this has not received nearly as much attention as the LGBT uh, discrimination law. Well, you're absolutely right. It's a horrifying case on legal grounds, on social grounds. Uh, it's, it's actually, I think, tr uh, suggesting a kind of dystopian future when the state claims the right contro to control women's bodies in ways that we don't even see typically in the U.S. today. Why it's received so little attention, I think, is because the fundamental right of women to control their bodies is at issue, and people are afraid of that. And this is a case where uh, I think there's no interpretation of a, this other than a, a nearly fascistic attempt by the state of Indiana to control women, and I think it scares people. Mm -hmm. And of course, telling that the only two women charged so far are immigrant women of color. And finally, the award-winning journalist and political prisoner Mumia Abu-Jamal, whose commentaries we routinely broadcast, has apparently been hospitalized. It happened yesterday on an unspecified medical emergency. Abu-Jamal was moved to a facility in Pennsylvania, about 10 miles from where he is imprisoned, and advocates are urging authorities to let his wife visit him. The hospitalization came on the same day that a judge heard arguments in Harrisburg on a Pennsylvania law being challenged by inmates, including Abu Jamal. The so-called mental anguish law effectively silences the voices of incarcerated people like Abu Jamal on the grounds that their speech causes mental anguish to the victims of the crimes they were convicted of. Abu Jamal, who gave a recorded commencement speech to a college in Vermont, has remained politically active and vocal throughout his incarceration. Well, Bob, we already strip inmates and former felons of so many rights, and now this law is saying, at least in Pennsylvania, that they have no free speech rights either. Is this just an attempt to silence Mumia Abu-Jamal? It seems quite clear the law was passed precisely for that reason. It's an appalling law in a lot of ways. First of all, we should recognize that there are cases, perhaps, where a convicted inmate, let's say a rapist, might try to harass a victim. But this is not a law that's going to address that. The, the 
problem with this law in the first blanche is that it involves injunctions and involves the state actually suppressing speech before it happens. And the U.S. Supreme Court has never allowed this kind of broad application of an injunction. In a way, it's kind of a, you could call it a kind of a reverse political correctness. <laughs> the right wing is always arguing that the left is trying to suppress free speech. But this is a case where the right is trying to suppress the speech of people who want to talk about public policy. This isn't going to be used in the way that might be reasonable. It's going to be used, as you point out, precisely to suppress speech about the government, about the actions of government officials. And in that sense, it's so blatantly unconstitutional, it's hard to imagine a federal judge accepting this law. And members of our audience can visit prismradio.org for more information on Abu Jamal's condition and this law. Robert Jensen, thanks as always for joining us. Thanks, Sonali. My guest, uh, Bob Jensen, is an author and a professor of journalism at the University of Texas at Austin. This